Hello, everyone. Welcome to IEA's webinar on Energy Technology Perspectives 2015. Uh, my name is Kevin Tu. I am the China Program Manager at the International Energy Agency. I'm from IEA's Office of Global Energy Policy, and our office is responsible for leading and guiding IEA's relations with partner country. Cooperation with partner country is mainstream across the work of all substantive directorates and divisions of the agency. One of the most notable examples is IEA's flagship publication, Energy Technology Perspectives. Today, I am very glad to moderate a webinar that focuses on the role of energy technology innovation in mobilizing climate action to accelerate the transition towards a more sustainable global energy system with a focus on the ETP's global energy outlook, emerging economies, and China. Now, I'd like to invite my colleague, Mr. Jean-Francois Scania, head of IEA's Energy Technology Policy Division, to give an open remark. Jean-Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, uh, I want to also thank all the participants uh, for what seems to be, again, a very successful uh, ETP webinar. Uh, these are very important to us because they help us to increase the outreach of our work, building on the success that we have with our roadshows coming to different countries and present our analysis. This allows us to go a lot more deeper into some of the uh, specific issues. And I was very, very pleased to see the success we had on the previous version uh, that, that happened a few weeks ago, where we had more, more than 200 participants listen to the detailed findings of our is on the global importance of the issues we deal with. Uh, for the IA, as Kevin mentioned, outreaching beyond IA membership is a main outcome and a main objective of our work. We realize that we will not be able to transition to a sustainable energy system if not all countries work together. And that's why we have so many efforts going into encouraging and supporting multilateral collaboration initiatives. We also have within the ETP project itself a uh, standing program that focuses on one of the IA's key partner countries year on year. So last year we had a focus on India's power generation system when we were looking at the role that electricity played in a global uh, energy system transition. This year, as we try to identify what the role innovation can play to provide solutions so that climate negotiators have higher uh, confidence that they can meet very ambitious targets, we had a deep dive look into China's innovation system, understanding how China is using innovation at the, as the engine of its economic growth. And next year, when we move to looking at how urban systems actually play an essential role in the global energy transition, we will be focusing on Mexico and how Mexico is working with its local governments to really uh, enable them to meet a very ambitious energy transition objective. And so being able to work specifically with our partner countries, understanding the challenges that they face, but also le learning from their experience is extremely important to make sure that our advice is relevant to the global community. It's also specifically important in this year's topic because what we find is that there's more than 70% of the cost-effective technical solutions that will allow us to move to a sustainable energy system that will be deployed in non-IEA member countries. And therefore, it's very important that we work together to identify those solutions, build the tools and the capacity for those technologies to be developed and adapted to local environments, and make sure there is local capacity to deploy the right technologies where they will have the highest impact. It's extremely important that we realize that not all solutions have the same role to play in every region, and the IA has had a long-standing program to work with individual countries understanding specific local requirements and helping build that local capacity. In fact, 
We run a global energy technology network that brings together more than 6,000 scientists working on specific areas of the energy system. And part of that network, 15% of participants actually come from non-IEA countries. This is a terrific showcase of how technology is a, a, a terrific tool to build relationships, to entice collaboration, and to help build the capacity worldwide to learn from each other's lessons while making sure we understand the environments in which those lessons have been learned. It's also a great tool to combine resources so that we are as efficient and effective as, as we possibly can in terms of accelerating innovation for it to deliver on this, the solutions that we need to move our energy system to a sustainable future. Now, this great network of experts is also comp complemented by many other programs within the IEA. A very noteworthy one is our Technology Roadmap Program that really looks at understanding step by step what needs to happen over the long run for each of these solutions to play their role. And we are looking at, at uh, increasing this program, having a more regional look and understand really specific local issues that we address both through our how-to guide program, which helps countries develop their own roadmaps, as well as to national specific roadmaps we develop with our partners. And so these suite of tools allow the IEA to basically build on the, the extensive experience that we've had over the past 40 years in encouraging multilateral relationships and technology collaboration. And I certainly hope that today's discussions will help bring various togethers closer together and entice higher participation in our global multilateral technology collaboration activities. And so with these few words and these high expectations, I now turn back the floor to Kevin so that he can take us through the rationale of today's presentations and guide us through the different steps. Uh, John Francois, thank you very much for your nice introduction. As climate negotiators work towards a deal in COP21 in Paris that would limit the increase in global temperature, interest is growing in the essential role technology innovation can and must play in enabling the transition to a no carbon system. Indeed, recent success story clearly indicate that there is a significant and untapped potential for accelerating innovation in clean technologies if proper policy frameworks are in place. In addition, given the important role of emerging economies uh, especially China. Uh, that's why today we will have three presentations in our program. Each of today's speakers will have 30 minutes to present the research findings to set the scene. The first speaker will talk about the global energy outlook and the second presentation will, will focus on low carbon innovation in emerging economies followed with the final presentation that focus on China. Now I'd like to introduce today's first speaker. Uh, Uber Ermi is the energy analyst in the Energy Technology Policy Division of the International Energy Agency. Well, he leads the energy supply side analysis within the Energy Technology Perspectives project. He has more than 10 years experience in energy system modeling and analysis prior to joining the IEA. He worked as researcher at the University of Stuttgart on several national and European projects in the field of energy modeling as well as assessment of technology and policy instruments. Uber, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome to, to everyone from my side. As, as Kevin uh, told, I would like to give you an overview about uh, some of the um, transitions that we think are needed uh, to achieve globally a two-degree uh, pathway and also talk about or discuss some of the challenges uh, that we think are, need to be tackled in this transition. Um, so to start with, if we um, 
if you look at the drivers that influence energy demand, GDP is, is definitely uh, one of the, the main factors influencing global energy use. And also, um, energy access is also a pre precondition in, in many parts of the world for economic development and also social development. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's an automatism between uh, economic growth and, and energy use. Actually, if we look at the and the intensity of GDP over the last decade, we see a decoupling with an annual rate of 1.1% per year. And in our two-degree scenario, we want to achieve, as I said, the um, uh, two-degree pathway. Uh, this rate has to be accelerated to 2.6% uh, uh, per year. So there's clearly a decoupling needed between energy use and economic growth. And uh, if we look into the, uh, our two-degree scenario there, the total primary energy demand in 2050 is only 20% uh, roughly 20% higher than uh, today. Um, we also looked in our analysis as in a so-called um, six-degree scenario, or short 60s, and that scenario basically assumes no additional policy measures to tackle climate change other than the already existing ones. And there we actually see an increase in primary energy demand of two-thirds by 2050. So clearly there's space for decoupling economic growth and, and energy use. The, the second measure that we have to, uh, to look in is then to, uh, to decarbonize the remaining energy use uh, through the deployment of um, renewable technologies, um, CCS, and to some extent also nuclear. And overall, by doing that, we can reduce the energy intensity of primary energy use from roughly um, 60 kilograms per kilojoule today. That's roughly, just to give you some orientation, the carbon intensity of natural gas today to one-third, meaning 20 kilograms per kilojoule by 2050. Um, so these two measures are um, clearly important. First, uh, energy efficiency to decouple economic growth and energy efficiency, and the second one, to reduce the carbon intensity of the rest of the energy that's, that's needed. And uh, these two matters are especially important also if you look at the uh, non OECD countries because already today these part, these part of the world is responsible for 60% of the primary energy use. I mean, that's just illustrated, yeah, and that's basically highlighting that um, these two measures that we have to reduce um, the energy intensity of GDP and also the CO2 intensity um, of the remaining energy use by 60% over the horizon in our two-degree scenario. Um, as I said, the non-OECD region is quite important uh, in already today in the in uh, primary energy use. This map illustrates the, um, the scale of the different countries based on their energy use and clearly see that China is today already the largest uh, primary energy consumer followed by the If we take a look how was what was the situation 35 years ago, there we see that in 1980 the US and also Western Europe was, was dominating primary energy use in the world. If we take now this look into the future in uh, 2050, there we see even more a shift uh, of, the, of, the, of the center of primary energy use um, to the east. So we see increase of energy use in the Middle East and especially also in India. So India alone is responsible for 40% of the global primary energy demand increase by 2050 in our four degree scenario. So it highlights really the importance of developing and emerging economies in the global um, future energy system. If we look at the, um, at the technology or measures needed to achieve um, a two-degree uh, pathway, so you see here the evolution of the CO2 emissions in, our, in this globally on a six-degree scenario, and that's the target trajectory that, uh, that's needed to achieve a two-degree pathway. Um, by the way, a two-degree scenario overall has a limit of remaining carbon emissions that the world can emit of roughly 1,000 gigatons, so to give a 50% chance of reaching a two-degree uh, target. And so how can we basically get from the six-degree scenario to the two-degree scenario? And important measures really lies in the, in the end use side. So there we see that um, alone um, measures to improve the end use efficiency and also fuel switching on the end use side 
from carbon fuels, for example, to electricity, uh, can have contribution of almost half of the emission reductions that are needed uh, by 2050. Um, further measures are then the um, deployment um, of renewable fuels and technologies um, on the end use side, for example, the transport sector, but also in the especially in power generation, as you see later. And um, also CCS and nuclear can provide um, uh, important contributions to decarbonize then the, the remaining energy used. So um, what's the role of these different uh, measures in the different um, parts of the energy system? So if you look um, at um, energy efficiency, that's specifically important in, in, the, in the energy sectors, buildings, transport, um, and industry. Um, fuel switching is particularly important um, uh, in, the, in the transport sector. Uh, where we see then also use of um, electricity, um, uh, to some extent hydrogen, also natural gas to, to replace um, oil. Um, if you look at renewables, um, it's um, again important in, in the transport sector. They are, for example, especially to decarbonize uh, transport modes where electricity is more difficult to use, like aviation and, and shipping. Uh, but specifically also, as you see in the graph at the bottom, uh, in the power sector to decarbonize um, electricity generation. And uh, finally, CCS is um, also important um, in the power sector, but specifically also, which is often neglected in industry to, uh, to reduce carbon emissions um, that are not uh, energy related, but basically process emissions of the industrial production processes like in the cement industry, iron and steel, or also the chemical sector. Um, so as you see here, energy efficiency uh, a huge contribution in, in the transition to a two-degree pathway, but that's not only the only benefit of energy efficiency. Clearly, energy efficiency um, has additional benefits like uh, reducing the energy costs uh, for consumers and also improving energy security. Um, we try to identify what's the contribution of energy efficiency in a two-degree scenario by comparing it to a case where we've frozen the energy efficiency um, in the future to the uh, energy efficiency level in 2012. So that's basically the red line that you see here, this kind of frozen um, efficiency case, and compared it then to the um, final energy demand that we see in the two-degree scenario. So there you see in the two-degree scenario after 2020, the global final energy demand is is uh, stagnating on a level. And the shaded area illustrates the amount of energy um, that can be saved by energy efficiency in the two-degree um, scenario. And that amount is um, amounts to 2,700 um, exajoule. And this number, just to put it into context, corresponds to the final glo or the global final energy consumption of the world over the last seven years. So clearly, energy efficiency has not only climate benefits, but also helps to reduce, uh, helps to increase energy security and also reduce costs for, for energy consumers. If we look at the um, mix of the remaining energy use, um, by 2050 we see um, declining role of fossil energy carriers in the final mix, and actually electricity becomes the uh, fastest growing final energy carrier in the two degree scenario, increasing its share from today around 80% to 26% um, by 2050 through increased use of electricity, for example, in, uh, in heat pumps in the building sector or for EVs in transport. Uh, so in the following, I want to give an overview of some of the developments that we see um, in the four um, sectors, electricity, industry, uh, transport, industry, industry and buildings. Um, so we'll start with the electricity sector. What you see here is the evolution of the electricity generation mix in our two-degree scenario. So there, um, fossil fuel continue with a share of around two-thirds the electricity generation mix in that scenario. Um, then if you compare that to um, the two-degree scenario, so we see a drastic change, uh, declining contribution of of fossil fuels without CCS and specifically renewable sources um, take the lead in providing or uh, covering energy electricity needs with a share of more than 60% by 2050 and also nuclear and CCS play an important role to, to decarbonize 
um, the rest of the electricity generation. Clearly, this transition to a decarbonized electricity system poses challenges. It's not only that we uh, have to accelerate the deployment of uh, low-carbon electricity generation technologies, as we will uh, see also in a later presentation, but we also have to think about what to do with the, uh, with the existing capacity stock. Uh, that means if we look today at the, um, at, the, at the coal capacity that's existing today or under construction, around 1,000 gigawatts of that capacity um, are still in operation or can be in operation in 2050, and that corresponds to a CO2 emission amount of uh, around 5 gigatons in 2050, which is clearly above the target that we see in 2 degree scenario for the power sector of around 1.5 gigatons. So it clearly means that we have to look also at how to address, uh, address how to how to decarbonize, how to address these um, uh, existing uh, coal capacity or locked-in coal capacity. And um, there, there are measures to reduce the CO2 impact by, for example, co-firing um, with biomass or by uh, retrofitting existing plants with CCS. Um, but our analysis also shows that uh, retirements of existing uh, capacity before the end of the technical lifetime are unavoidable to achieve a two-degree scenario. So we estimate in the two-degree scenario that uh, capacity in the magnitude, or uh, co-capacity in the magnitude of seven has to be retired by the end of the lifetime to achieve, still achieve um, the two degree um, scenario. So that's to the power sector. Now, um, if, we, if we look at the, at the transport sector, there are basically the, the actions that are needed there can be su uh, summarized uh, with three keywords, uh, three, uh, three keywords, avoid, shift, and improve. Avoid means that uh, we try to avoid unnecessary travel, for example, to, to better urban planning to, uh, through, through teleworking. Um, shift means that we uh, shift uh, transport needs uh, to, to low, lower carbon intensive modes, for example, uh, from, uh, to, to public transport or from air travel to, uh, to high-speed trains, and finally improve needs that we have to uh, introduce uh, new technologies and low-carbon fuels um, to cover the remaining, uh, to cover the transport demand. Um, the impact of, the, um, of, the, of these measures in, uh, in our scenarios is shown here. So in six degree, we see roughly a doubling of global uh, transport demand uh, by 2050, and through this mix of avoid, shift, and improve measures, we can basically stabilize the uh, tra global transport demand at uh, today's levels. And if you look at the at the regions, you also see that in the OECD, we uh, we uh, can even reduce transport demand below today's level. And if you look at the non-OECD on the right side, you also see that we can drastically reduce the growth of transport demand in that part of the world in the two degree scenarios through these three measures. Um, so what's the impact of the, on the CO2 emissions of these uh, three measures that are shown, shown in, the, in the following graph? On, on the left side, you see that um, the shift and improve measures have a contribution of around 15% to CO2 reductions between the 6 and uh, 2 DS um, in uh, in the transport sector, and um, that uh, efficiency improvements and also introduction of new technologies in the transport sector have the potential to basically stabilize the CO2 emissions, uh, or sorry, greenhouse gas emissions of the transport sector at today's level. If you look at the different transport modes, um, there you see that the, uh, the uh, large part of the reductions are needed in road transportation, so meaning um, Passenger vehicles, but also uh, but also uh, freight transport or trucks, and so there the, the challenge is that uh, up to 20 or the first part of the model horizon, up to 2030, uh, important measures are to improve vehicle impo vehicle uh, efficiency and also to uh, to introduce uh, shift avoid and shift measures. Uh, but after 2030, we also have to focus strongly on the deployment of new vehicle technologies like electric vehicles. Uh, or fuel cell vehicles. Um, so overall, if you look at 2050 and the vehicles or light duty vehicle sales in that year, um, three quarters of the sales are vehicle sales are actually either electric vehicles, truck and hybrid electric vehicles, or fuel cell vehicles. So that's just really in stress the fact that we really have to um, focus on also new technologies 
in the transport sector in the two degree scenario. Looking at the at the industry sector, so industry is the largest final energy consumers uh, across the uh, three energy sectors, building, transport, and industry. So industry is responsible for roughly 40% of global final energy consumption uh, today, and the, the growth in industrial production is actually more and more shifting to the non-OECD parts of the world. For example, if we uh, if we look at China, the um, steel production in China more than tripled um, since 2005, and this trend also continues or can also be observed in other parts of the world. What's shown here is the share of the five um, energy intensive sectors in total industrial energy demand in different parts of the world, and you see here that the, the share of these energy intensive sectors is increasing in all parts of in most countries of the world except the OECD countries. So that's clearly also showing that um, the, the deployment of new um, technologies in industry has to focus in, in non-OECD um, uh, countries. Um, that's on the one opportunity to introduce their best available uh, technologies, um, but also poses challenges in terms of um, ensuring that uh, technology is available, so technology access is an issue, also financing and also expertise and knowledge in uh, in these um, in these best developed technologies also is becoming can, or can be a possible barrier for the deployment of these technologies in that area. Um, if we uh, look into the uh, into the future in terms of uh, material production, we see uh, slower growth in our scenarios um, for China and even a decline in industrial in cement and iron steel production in China after 2020. But um, we see continued growth, accelerating growth in other parts of the world. For example, in, in India, we, we see in that scenario, or in our scenarios, a tripling of cement and steel demand between today and uh, 2050. Um, in terms of energy demand, what are, what's the impact of these um, production growth? So in the 60 degree scenario, we, uh, we estimate that industrial final energy demand would increase by uh, 80%. And in the two degree scenario, um, this growth can be half. So there, the growth is roughly around 34% um, in term, in uh, industrial global final energy demand. If you look at the um, at the um, CO2 reduction measures in industry, um, so in the over the next um, decade. Um, the introduction of best available technology efficient energy efficiency measures and also the um, switch to low carbon fuels as well as increasing for example the recycling rates in um, for for steel or for aluminium um, can uh, can help uh, to uh, to reduce emissions but as you see also to uh, to achieve the necessary reductions we also have to think about or have to introduce uh, what's shown here is innovative technologies um, in the industry uh, sector or in the different industry uh, subsectors. And there, CCS plays a very important role. As I mentioned before, a process emissions uh, becomes really an issue in, uh, in uh, sectors like cement, iron, and steel, and chemicals. For example, in, in the cement sector, around 60% of the total CO2 emissions of that sector are actually process emissions. And um, if you look in 2050, um, there, CCS accounts for roughly 30% of the annual reductions in the industry sector between the six and the two degree scenario. So clearly, CCS isn't just a power sector technology. It's very much important also um, to reduce CO2 in the industry sector. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, so moving now to the uh, to the building sector. The building sector today is responsible um, for around 30% of the final energy consumption, and also for a similar share in in, in global CO2 emissions. Um, the interesting aspect of these uh, of the CO2 emission impact of the building sector is that uh, roughly 70% is not allocated to direct emissions in the building sector, but basically related to the use or the production of electricity and district heat being used in the building sector. 
Um, so it also means that if we talk about energy efficiency measures for CO2 reduction in the building sector, the, the largest impact is actually not so much seen in the building sector itself, but in more in the reduction of upstream emissions um, in the power sector. Uh, this, does not, does, this does not mean that uh, there are no benefits uh, of introducing energy efficiency in the building sector. As mentioned before, there are also additional uh, benefits like reduced energy costs uh, for consumers. And if you look at the, um, at the final energy demand in different parts of the world in the building sector, uh, we uh, see in the, in the 6 degree scenario roughly an increase of um, 60% between today and 2050, and this growth can be reduced in a 2 degree scenario to around um, 12%. And as you see in the graph, in some non-OECD countries, it's even possible to reduce the building's energy demand below today's level. While if you look at India, there the growth in the two degree scenario in the building sector can be halved, and in China, the growth can be even reduced by two thirds in uh, final energy demand in the building sector. Um, the policies that have to be uh, have to be uh, introduced or the issues that have to be addressed are quite different in different parts of the world. So if you look at the at OECD countries, there the issue is uh, more related to renovating or improving the existing building stock while in emerging or uh, emerging economies or developing our community issues is more related to uh, to uh, uh, regulate uh, the new build um, uh, or increasing demand in the building sector. Um, so the policies that have to be introduced are quite different. A common element, however, in the building sector is that we uh, see in all parts of the world the increased role of electricity um, in the building sector, so the share of electricity in the building sector increases from around 30% today to 40% by 2050 in the two degree scenario. So it illustrates again the increased role of electricity. Once it's decarbonized, it can also have benefits to reduce emissions in end use sectors like, like the building one. If you look at the um, energy saving potentials in the building sector or where basic energy can be saved in the building sector, we see over time that initially uh, large savings can be achieved in uh, space and water heating. If we then look out into the future, in, at the end of the model or under the horizon, we see also increasing contributions from electric appliances. It's also linked to the increased income levels and also ownership rates in, in emerging economies. So that overall, we estimate that between the 6 and the 2 ds we can in 2050, uh, save an energy amount of 35 exajoules, um, and that corresponds um, to, the, to the total final energy consumption of the building sector just of the OECD today. Again, so it's a huge potential also for energy savings um, in the building sector under a two-degree scenario pathway. Um, when we look at the building sector, sort of, um, uh, Heating plays a very important role, so we talk about space heating, but also water heating. And this role of heating is not just limited to the building sector, but overall, if you also include industrial um, heat applications, uh, in total, heating plays a very important role. Also, it's often neglected in the discussion, which often focuses on, on power generation. But as you see here, um, looking at, at primary energy uh, heating applications in uh, or heating and cooling applications in and account for um, uh, one third of the of the of the primary energy use, and the share even increases to more than 40%. If you look at the at the final energy consumption and the contributions to uh, CO2 emissions, um, double CO2 emission energy today of heating and cooling is around 30%. So actually, heating and cooling has been an important area that we uh, that we have also to focus on in the future. And uh, if you look at the structure of the energy use um, for heating and cooling. So today it's roughly equally split in final energy terms between, uh, between buildings and, and industry. Um, all the, the heat applications are quite different between these two sectors. So in buildings clearly we are using low temperature heat and the majority of 40% is used for space heating. Around one quarter is used each for water and, and cooking and the remainder is used for, uh, for, for cooling. Um, in industry Two thirds of the of the energy used for heating is going into applications in a temperature range from 200 and uh, 400 degrees Celsius. So clearly, there are quite some differences in terms of temperature levels between these two two uh, sectors. If you look at the at the fuel mix 
for uh, supplying heating needs. Um, today, around 70% of the energy used for heating is coming, heating cooling applications is coming from fossil energy, energy sources. This includes also the, um, the uh, energy that's used for electricity, uh, to produce electricity and district heating used for, uh, for heating cooling applications. Um, renewables um, account for the, for the rest of the energy used for heating and cooling. 90% um, of that is then biomass, often still today being uh, traditional biomass uh, used in an unsustainable way in, develop, uh, develop, uh, in developing countries. If you look at the, on the right side in, at the two degree scenario, um, there we see first the impact on energy efficiency. So there that basically can stabilize the um, final energy use of 2020, or keep constant after 2020, and also increasing uh, share of, of, of renewables. So the share of fossil fuels drops below 50%, which renewables can account for more than 40% of a uh, 40 percent of the uh, heating and cooling needs in the two degree scenario. If you look at the um, CO2 emissions of the for heating and cooling in the building sector that's illustrated here in six degree scenario we see a continued increase in CO2 emissions in terms of direct emissions but also indirect emissions um, which are occurring in, in, the, in the power sector for electricity and heat generation. And um, the emissions in a two-degree scenario for heating and cooling can be reduced by around 50%. And it's also shown here on the right side the important role of decarbonizing electricity and heat supply in reducing and also the emissions allocated to heating and cooling um, in the future. And um, I want to conclude uh, my presentation just to look at the, at the overall um, cost impact of the transition to a two-degree scenario. Um, so we estimate that the investment needs uh, roughly accumulate to around 40 trillion US dollars between uh, 2016 and 2050 in a two-degree scenario. And the majority or large part of the investment needs to go to the transport sector to introduce their uh, new technologies and new fuels by 2050. Uh, but the kind of good news, a good message is that large, uh, that the additional investment needs can be offset by, by fuel cost savings for fossil fuels. So we estimate that uh, these fuel cost savings can uh, can be up to 160 trillion US dollars. So that overall, we see net savings or net benefits in the transition to a two-degree scenario. Clearly, there are uncertainties in these assessments of these um, future costs and benefits. As you see at the bottom, it also depends on the on the discounting that's used, and also um, if we talk about the, the fuel cost savings that I mentioned, also depends on the on the on the price assumptions or the prices um, that are used to uh, to quantify um, the savings. Here we use uh, the, uh, the 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 cost of the primary energy in the 60 degree scenario. Again, there are uncertainties there, but clearly, if we just look at the at the reduction that fossil energy use, there are clearly benefits in the transition to the scenario that uh, can offset the additional investment needs um, that are needed in this transition. So that's all I wanted to say so far. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Uber, for your nice presentation. Uh, we have received some questions. However, because now it's already uh, 11.15, uh, I'd like to uh, move to the second presentation, and uh, in the end, we will have a Q&A session. We will address uh, the question we have received together. Uh, today, uh, our second presentation is uh, No Carbon Innovation in Emerging Economies. The speaker is uh, Daniel Hoppenai. Uh, he is a senior energy technology policy analyst at the Energy Technology Policy Division of the IEA. Well, uh, is managing the Energy Technology Perspective Project. Before joining the IEA in October 2014, he had been working in the field of energy and climate change for several departments of the Italian government. His area of professional interest including uh, technology diffusing, technology transfer, 
and the impact analysis. Um, the floor is yours, Daniel. Thank you, Kevin. So mm, this sorry about that. Thank you, Kevin. The this presentation will uh, provide you an overview of the chapter on um, low carbon innovation in emerging economies, uh, which was authored by Joanna Chiavari and also saw a significant contribution from our former colleague Dennis Best. And for the sake of terminology, um, un unless I will uh, specify uh, differently, I will use the term emerging economies to refer loosely to all OECD non-member economies, uh, though um, some ETP data uh, that was cited in the chapter refer to a specific group of emerging economies, uh, specifically Brazil, China, India, Russia, South Africa, and ASEAN countries. Emerging economies are crucial to reaching the two degree scenario and the three driving factors for energy demand, namely uh, demographic increases, growth in income as well as urbanization will be uh, significantly higher in emerging economies and um, the results in a sustained demand for energy services. Emerging economies will account for about 90% of energy demand growth in the six degrees scenario, which is uh, our baseline scenario, as you know. And uh, China, China alone accounted for more than 25% uh, uh, of the pro uh, projected growth in primary energy uh, demand. So uh, one important thing to mention, mention is that uh, uh, a challenge in emerging economies is still energy access and while larger uh, portions of the population have adopted energy intensive lifestyles, many citizens still do not have access to modern energy services. Therefore, uh, the uh, reduction of energy policy is uh, a priority for all governments where there is still lack, lack of access to clean cooking fuels or electricity. So when we are talking about low carbon innovation in, in emerging economies, it is important to understand the synergies and trade-offs between climate change mitigation and energy poverty. By 2050, as it was mentioned, nearly 75% of annual reductions in energy related carbon emissions in the 2DS will need to come from non-OECD countries. And the growing demand for energy and the infrastructure needed to provide it creates a unique opportunity for emerging economies to reduce energy-related CO2 emissions by uh, deploying innovative low-carbon technology. During the infrastructure build-out, emerging economies can be early movers in applying a systems approach to the rollout of advanced low-carbon technology. So all regions of the world have a role to play in making the 2DS possible and solutions to enable innovation to contribute delivering the 2DS will depend on local conditions as national circumstances and resources will drive different solutions and pathways. The uh, regional technology shares in primary energy supply in the 2DS, as you can see in the figure, show a strong variation among regions. So emerging countries have both different starting points, different pathways, and different end solutions to meeting climate goals. This variety of solutions is good news for emerging con economies so that they can develop uh, technologies where they can have a, a competitive advantage. And so this will help uh, these countries to uh, develop their own decarbonization strategies. It is important to understand not only what the contribution in innovation could be to decarbonize the energy system, but uh, where innovative energy technology will be a deployment.
most of the deployment uh, uh, in low carbon technology over the last decade has been concentrated in OECD countries. But uh, it should be mentioned that there is a shift underway as most of emerging economies have had greater growth rates in deployment rates of the, over the past few years. And this trend is going to be uh, accelerated. However, if we want to be back on track to meet the two degree scenario, we will need a strong acceleration in deployment rates in emerging economies. For instance, as you see, can see from the figure around 2020, emerging economies as a whole will need to have the same deployment rates of solar PV and wind as OECD countries. So there is a great opportunity for low carbon lock-in in that uh, a large portion of the infrastructure and the energy systems that will support rising energy demand in energy economies has not been built yet. So there is a significant opportunity to leapfrog to more sustainable energy systems through the adoption of advanced low carbon technologies. We should not forget that emerging economies have already delivered innovative products and processes and at different scales and with different degrees of technical complexity. For instance, the Kenyan Chico allowed to significantly increase the efficiency of using charcoal in cooking stoves and also reduce indoor air pollution. Biogasifiers, for example, India has a long history on, on, on this. It is estimated that biogas facilities exist in over 2 million households in rural India. And then another example is the Brazilian bioethanol production program, which started as early as the 70s. And in terms of what is going on, there, there, there are also important RD programs being carried out. One of these is the India and China Storio program. With the ongoing and uh, projected increase of energy use and uh, related CO2 emissions in emerging economies, there is an urgent need to better understand the size of their RD and D budget, their energy innovation policies, and the effectiveness of their initiatives. But uh, despite uh, various international initiatives, uh, the data concerning spending on low carbon RD and D on emerge in emerging economies are still scarce, and the the in fact. Um, the data available indicates that uh, the governments of uh, five emerging economies, namely Brazil, China, Russia, so, uh, South Africa, plus Mexico, uh, control larger amounts of energy rd and funding than the governments of all IA countries. So this can be partly explained by the fact that the, this estimate includes investment by 100% state-owned enterprises and which accounted for around 90% of the total investments in these emerging economies. And also another uh, thing to consider is that OECD numbers include only direct government RD and D spending, whereas private funding plays a much bigger role in the latter. However, however when we look um, uh, data on uh, patent inventions related to climate change mitigation, as we see in the figure, we see that inventions uh, remain concentrated in OECD countries, with China being the only emerging economy in the top five inventors. So one other interesting finding is that a uh, greater number of patentable inventions are produced by emerging economies when their researchers collaborate with OECD countries. In terms of strategies, emerging economies will need to get fast access to low carbon technologies through a combination of adopt, adapt, and develop. Technology adoption refers to cases in which a technology is acquired from external sources and then deployed domestically without any changes to its parameters. Technology adaptation refers to cases in which some parameters of a technology acquire, are acquired 
from external sources are changed. And then uh, the uh, domestic technology development uh, applies to cases in which the innovation is carried out in domestically and the, the technology can be uh, developed by research institutes or private firms. In this case, uh, most uh, if not all of the technology parameters uh, reflect uh, local needs. One important step to optimize uh, resources for RD and D in emerging economies, as all other countries, is setting technology priorities. <coughs> but this presents a particular challenge in emerging economies, as both the context and technology opportunities are evolving rapidly. The build-up of innovation capacity in emerging economies can be supported with a, a variety of means acting at different stages of the technology cycle. One of these means is in security and energy access. And, and I should say that there are uh, examples of success stories out there, including south-to-south -south, uh, joint technological cooperation efforts. In conclusion, uh, the growing uh, dynamic market of energy markets of emerging economies provide the most conducive environment for in energy innovation and in and having said that, industrial and emerging economies need to work together to ensure innovative solutions can be uh, deployed to the extent needed by uh, an ambitious low carbon scenario like the ETP two degree scenario. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Itanio, uh, for your uh, nice presentation. Um, now I'd like to move to the third presentation entitled Energy Technology Innovation in China. Uh, before uh, I turn the floor to my colleague, I'd like to express our sincere appreciation for Mr. Fan Jun from the ARC21 Center at the Ministry of Science and Technology um, in China. Uh, he worked uh, with uh, our ETP teams uh, in 2015 to develop uh, the China-related chapter for this publication. Uh, today, the third presentation will be presented by Keith Bernard. He is the head of the Energy Supply Technology Unit in the IEA's Energy Technology and the Policy Divisions. Prior to joining the IEA, he enjoyed the spells with AEA Technology, the EPRI, ABB, and the British Co. Much of his career has been spent working on energy technology and policy issues, focusing particularly on fossil fuels and power generation. His publications for the IEA have covered upstream oil and gas technologies gas filed power generation and high efficiency, no emissions co-filed power generation. Keith, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so, energy technology innovation in China. Well, in few other places in the world do we see such a dynamic case of an all of the above energy strategy. Energy technology innovation, with a strong focus on clean energy, is central to a <coughs> strategy that faces the dual challenge of satisfying energy demands while safeguarding the environment. Indeed, this is part of China's self-proclaimed energy revolution. In 2013, under President Xi, the Chinese government introduced a concept termed the China Dream a framework for unlocking China's creative and innovative forces to guide sustained and sustainable development. Don't forget, 
China had already come a long way in the previous two decades. With the expansion of its energy system having played a major role in its sevenfold increase in GDP while lifting 400 million people from extreme poverty. In the face of increasing energy demands, China in 2014 announced its joint statement with the United States, where it set a target to constrain CO2 emissions by 2030. There are already positive signs that China is a leader in low carbon technology and increasingly in innovation. And China's R&D intensity is increasing. That is its R&D spend as a proportion of GDP. A key aspect will be to enable innovation within and beyond the large state-owned companies that dominate the energy sector. In practice, pursuing the China dream requires a long-term international cooperation, joining global networks that promote innovation in climate and energy technology. So this chapter examines China's evolving innovation system and its critical role not only in realizing an energy revolution, but also in responding to the global climate and energy challenge. Looking at China today, we see China's primary energy mix is dominated by fossil fuels, with a share in excess of 85%. However, relying on fossil fuels to such an extent presents challenges. Over time, China will need to tackle an increased dependence on imports, declining energy security, and increased fuel price volatility, along with the need to address domestic transport and infrastructure bottlenecks. Now, as we know, China is addressing environmental issues and climate change as a priority. As we can see in the graph, China's carbon emissions per unit of GDP the yellow line and energy consumption per unit of GDP, the red line, have come down significantly since 1990. The effort to cut emissions in the energy sector will remain important. China has established a long-term target to reduce carbon intensity by 40 to 45 percent by 2020 compared to its 2005 value. Based on available data, China is broadly on track to reach that target. But as we can see quite clearly, the carbon intensity of the energy sector, the gray line, has remained essentially static. So let's look further out to 2030. In November 2014, China made a joint announcement with the United States to peak greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and to make non-fossil energy 20% of the primary energy mix by the same year. Such a pursuit will require progress on several energy technology fronts. But greenhouse gas targets are just one aspect of a multifaceted approach as China seeks to balance economic, social and environmental challenges in a little over two decades, China's primary energy demand has increased more than threefold, its GDP sevenfold, its installed power generation capacity ninefold, and its electricity generation almost eightfold, huge expansions in such a short period of time. In recognition of the mounting contribution of fossil fuel use to local air, water, and land pollution, and the escalation of water scarcity, sustainability has become an important theme of China, Chinese energy policy. This was recognized since the beginning of the 11th five-year plan, but more so since 2012. In China cities, infrastructure, and the environment. Fine particulates are particularly harmful. In January 2013, one-sixth of China's territory 
were subjected to a sustained period of severe air pollution, during which a concentration of fine particulates in Beijing reached 40 times the exposure limit uh, recommended by the World Health Organization. We recognize that policies aimed at reducing air pollution have a significant impact on energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. For example, reducing oil dependence or reducing the demand for coal in the electricity sector both lower CO2 emissions. China's war on air pollution includes targets to reduce coal share of power generation from 79% in 2011 to below 65% in 2017. Beyond air pollution, the problem of water scarcity is also one that is increasingly exercising the minds of those charged with energy system planning in China. The impacts of water pollution, increasing water consumption, fresh water withdrawals and expansion of water stress zones are major challenges. Large thermal power plants, whether nuclear, coal, gas, as well as some renewable energy applications such as biofuel use and concentrating solar power can consume large quantities of water. For moving further uh, towards further deployment of clean energy and greenhouse gas emissions reductions. As you can see, the graph shows an array of long-term scenarios projecting trajectories for China's CO2 emissions to 2050. The figures are from analyses undertaken in the United States and China as well as the IEA. China's enhanced low carbon scenario, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory's continuous improvement scenario, or CIS, and its accelerated improvement scenario, or AIS, and the IEA's 2DS peak between 8 gigatons and 12 gigatons prior to 2030, all representing options for peaking that are broadly currently broadly consistent with the United States-China joint statements. However, no new policy, uh, policies were to be, if no new policies were to be implemented, the IEA 60S suggests that China's emissions could reach 12 gigatons by 2020 and 16 gigatons by 2050. China's 40 to 45 percent reduction target by 2020, its enhanced low carbon scenario, puts it on track to reduce emissions that are roughly consistent with the 2DS within the same time frame. Non-fossil energy targets of 15 percent of the energy mix by 2020 correspond closely to the non-fossil targets projected in the 2DS by 2020. While China anticipates that its CO2 emissions will peak around 2030, it recently announced that it will strive to reach that peak sooner. The peak, however, is likely to be later than shown in the 2DS, <coughs> where the emissions peak is around 2020, implying the need for a more stringent regime for China to meet the 2DS targets by 2050. Significantly, China is taking additional actions to manage its CO2 emissions. It's increasing its, uh, it is increasing afforestation and strengthening the management of forests. China's forest area in 2020 is targeted to be more than 40 million hectares higher than levels in 2005. Here we can look a little closer at the IEA's two degree scenario. The 2DS sets a very ambitious scenario for China, reducing 
annual emissions of CO2 by over 10 gigatons by 2050 compared with the 60S scenario. Here, it's important to note that the ETP scenarios for China are elements of global scenarios based on least cost mitigation, where CO2 emissions are priced uniformly around the globe. Projections from the scenario should not be confused with predictions or forecasts, or even with recommendations that China should commit to such a path. An equitable burden sharing of the efforts to mitigate climate change is unlikely to be similar to a cost-effective distribution of efforts. Based on the 2DS, cutting CO2 em emissions in ha by half compared with 2012 levels would be an enormous challenge. Almost 50% of the CO2 reductions would be achieved in the power sector by increasing efficiency, switching from coal to gas, increasing the contributions from nuclear power and renewable energy technologies, and deploying CCS. In industry, reductions would arise from improved process efficiency, fuel switching, and again, deploying CCS. As you can see, substantial efforts are required in the power sector, followed by industry and transport. Now looking more closely at industry, despite the limitations of input-based indicators, they do shed some light on how innovation is spread across regions and sectors. In 2011, business R&D spending in selected industrial sectors was 194 billion US dollars in OECD countries and China, a 10% increase in compound annual growth rate since 2000. China experienced the greatest overall growth in industrial R&D expenditure at 22% since 2000. The distribution of business R&D expenditure among the selected industrial sectors is similar throughout OECD countries, with the chemicals and petrochemicals sector standing out as a major investor in innovation. The sectoral mix differs in China, where the chemicals and petrochemicals sector still provides the greatest contribution, but where the base metals sector reaches almost a third of R&D expenditure. This sectoral distribution of R&D investments was stable between 2000 and 2011 in OECD countries, but in China, R&D spend shifted by 12% from the chemicals and petrochemicals sector to the basic metal sector. This shift reflects a structural change in China over the period when crude steel production increased more than fivefold. Industry accounted for 37% 37, 37 of final energy use on a global level in 2012, making industry the largest end use sector. Industrial production is moving more and more into non-OECD countries. For example, China has doubled its crude steel production since 2005 and accounts now for almost 50% of global production. Due to these shifts, the role of energy intensive sectors, aluminium, chemicals, cement, iron and steel, pulp and paper, in industrial consumption, increased in most parts of the world over the last two decades except the OECD. These new capacity additions in non-OECD countries open the opportunity to deploy best available technologies and low carbon processes. But rapid growth also poses challenges related to the limited availability of recycled materials, access to technologies and financing, as well as the need for capacity building. As we look at China's energy innovation landscape and the indicators of innovation, it is important to understand the context. Broadly speaking, innovation with Chinese characteristics emphasizes the role of developing local capacity and indigenous innovation, as well as integrating expertise and innovation from abroad. 
As we can see in the figure, China's energy technology innovation is driven by three policy objectives. Promoting industrial transformation, securing energy system optimization, and strengthening energy conservation and efficiency. In meeting these objectives, China has experimented and continues to promote its own indigenous innovation capacity through first-of-a-kind invention, integrating new design features into global leading technologies, and optimizing or adapting to China's local context. As these various approaches play out, we see the output or innovative activity estimated using a set of indicators that include metrics relating to patent developments and high-tech exports, along with the funding and R&D intensity. Financing for energy technology innovation benefits from several sources, state R&D funding, government subsidies, preferential government procurement, venture capital and international partnerships. We can see examples and outcomes and milestones highlight, highlighted in the figure. These indicators need to be considered collectively to paint a full picture of, innovative, uh, of innovation system performance. Here we can see how these and other policies have mobilized funding for R&D in China. And we can see how it compares with other innovation leaders. We see that in 2012, China's R&D intensity matched that of the European Union for the first time. Perhaps more, in, more significant is China's rapid rate of advance. From 2000 to 2012, China's R&D intensity doubled from 0.9% to 1.98%, while, while for comparison, the EU's R&D intensity rose more modestly from 1.74% to 1.98%. In 2013, China's R&D intensity climbed yet further, and R&D funding rose 192 billion US dollars, up 25 billion from 2012. As a sign of their dominant role, innovation enterprises took more than three quarters of the total R&D funding. Based on projections of the OECD, this trajectory is likely to continue to 2020. According to these projections, China would overtake the United States, the present global leader in R&D, in 2019. As China seeks to build its indigenous innovation capacity, it is engaging in a wide range of technology, manufacturing, and research fields. Many of these are interrelated and can spawn new innovations across a range of fields and technology applications. The cases shown highlight the current status of key sectors and technology areas where China may be closing the gap, if not leading. All this through applying innovation with Chinese characteristics. With the growth of innovation capacity, China's manufacturing base and technology deployment have been evolving from low cost made in China to designed and made in China and deployed in China and beyond. This move up the value curve can be demonstrated by looking at China's contributions to global patent development. Between 2000 and 2010, the growth of patent applications globally across energy technologies and specifically renewable energy experienced a remarkable increase a large share of the growth took place in China, especially in wind power, heating, insulation, solar power, and transmission and distribution. A good example to illustrate China's innovation progress is the case of solar power and LEDs. From 2000 to 2014, China's share of solar power and light emitting diode global exports increase from less than 10% to almost 40%. This correlates quite closely with a substantial increase in patent development over the same period. 
As China continues to move up the value chain in advanced technology and innovative systems, challenges and opportunities brought on by the shifting global technology transfer and diffusion landscape will affect both the import and export of technologies from China. As well as transforming traditional industries, by eliminating inefficient production capacity in areas like steel and cement production, China has identified seven strategic emerging industries, or SEIs. The SEIs cover energy efficient and environmental technologies, next, next generation information technology, biotechnology, advanced equipment manufacturing, new energy, new materials, and new energy vehicles. Importantly, the, con <clears throat> the convergence of energy science and technology policies are occurring at a crucial time in China's industrial transformation. Policies seek to encourage innovation in key technology areas, enhance platforms for industry innovation, and strengthen technology integration and industrial capacity. SEI support funds come from a mix of local government and private enterprise. Incentives include tax rebates with financial subsidies implemented to assist investment in SEIs. However, it's still unclear how foreign invested companies and international players will benefit. Support policies have local content requirements and government procurement criteria including requirements, for example, for domestic IPR. This may discriminate against foreign companies unwilling to import IP. The SEI program is likely to require iterative, te iterative testing and modification. In the figure, the cases shown highlight some major innovations in selected areas of the energy sector, renewable energy technologies, electric vehicles, and carbon capture and storage. Here we see a SWOT analysis of China's innovation system. It has adopted its own unique approach, innovation with Chinese characteristics. Its academic literature, innovation theory, and related policy statements promote a concept of indigenous innovation by developing, adopting, and adapting technologies for the local context. This strategy has advantages but it also poses challenges. For example, clear long-term policy expectations and market signals are vital for innovation in energy technologies and systems. They limit risk and give market players greater security in making large investments in R&D and infrastructure. China is increasingly steering away from five-year plans. Interim action plans have extended this interval to seven years or even 15. Due to a lack of legal enforcement, the issue of protecting IPR has been a major hurdle for companies to overcome when thinking about entering the Chinese market. As it moves its manufacturing base and technology up the value chain, it's essential that China is more respectful of IPR. Since joining the World Trade Organization in 2001, its legal framework has been strengthened and its IPR laws and regulations amended to further comply with the WTO agreement. Despite this, China continues to draw censure regarding its laxity in protecting IPR. The process of restructuring and transforming China's industry exposes regional markets to global trade risks. In this context, regional competition for GDP growth has influenced local government policies. Regional protectionism, one manifest manifestation of this competition, is a barrier to integrating local, uh, regional markets into national markets and even into global trade. The slow adoption of alternative energy vehicles in China provides a vivid illustration of local protectionism. Market boundaries have included technology barriers and pro product subsidies 
that have favoured local automobile manufacturers, even a central government has objected to local protectionism. Since October 2013, China has increased its near-term focus on mobilizing market forces and liberalizing policies to drive further change in the energy sector. This has included broad structural changes to the market, oversight of state-owned enterprises, pricing reforms, and the opening of opportunities to allow new entrants into previously monopolized markets. In most sectors, crucial to energy and climate challenges, however, command control measures still dominate. In the coal sector, for example, there has been a focus on consolidation, boosting efficiency, limiting pollutants, reducing environmental impacts, and reforming pricing policies, including water consumption and water pricing policies. Ambitious, large-scale initiatives such as high-speed rail and other large industry projects are also supported by command control and single purchaser programs that play an outsized role in how technology demand develops. The development of new innovative sectors and low carbon energy technologies may depend on China striking a balance between central planning and market forces, as the example of the shale industry shows, the shale gas industry sorry, shows. Encouraging the development of public-private partnerships and advancing funding and financing to support innovative pro approaches to new markets and partnership mechanisms will be crucial to maximize China's innovation opportunities. An example is China's National Fund for Technology Transfer and Commercialization. The NFTTC was co-established by the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Ministry of Finance. It encourages, uh, sorry, it leverages private sector capital investment funds to promote commercialization of innovative technologies, advanced products, materials, equipment, and systems promoted by national and regional R&D projects. The VCSF, or Venture Capital Subfund, is a public-private partnership pl platform. It leverages private venture capital funds, local government investment, other private equity investment, including foreign capital, and existing government science and technology funds. Initiated in 2014, the, VCF, uh, the VCSF is a nascent program, but already Beijing-based venture capital firms have shown strong interest in the platform. So, to some recommended actions. China's long-term energy policy objectives are closely linked to its current energy challenge, which is to secure a future of safe, reliable, economically efficient, and clean energy. Simultaneously, in the near term, science and technology policy seeks to increase R&D intensity, enhanced innovation capacity, increase links between technology and the economy, benefit social welfare, and foster greater talent and skills. Over the past decade, China has used its energy and S&T policies to advance technology development. As it continues in this direction, while integrating further institutional, institutional and market reforms, the IEA offers some recommendations to further focus China's innov innovation systems development at the nexus of energy technology and climate imperatives. In conclusion, <coughs> I'd like to leave you with the following. In China, as elsewhere, policy and institutional progress uh, processes sorry, need to harness the co-benefits provided by low-carbon technologies and more resilient innovation and energy systems. By boosting energy technology innovation, we enhance health, economic, and other outcomes. Secondly, 
monitoring and evaluating innovation measures against energy sector and environmental performance is important. Over time, it can mobilize greater institutional support for technology commercialization, enabling more effective decision making that will get us to a two degree scenario. And thirdly, further engagement with global innovation networks while building domestic institutions can lead to win-win outcomes. And finally, before I leave, I'd like to thank the key contributors to this chapter. Chinyuan and Fan Jun both spent a year with us under a secondment program we have with China's Ministry of Science and Technology. And Dennis Best was also a uh, key contributor. He is now at the University of C California, Berkeley. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Keith, for your presentation. Uh, now it seems uh, we have more time for group Q&A. Uh, that's uh, great. We have already received uh, some questions for our previous speakers. So uh, you're encouraged to send us uh, uh, questions ideally. If you can uh, let us know uh, who you would like to address your questions to, that will be great. As today's uh, moderators, I would not like to start with uh, a couple of questions by myself. Uh, my first question uh, is to uh, Uber. So in your presentation, uh, you have one slide uh, which shows the share of energy intensive sectors in industrial energy use has grown in most part of the world, except for the OECD countries. So I just wonder, uh, uh, what's the reason behind uh, such difference in emerging countries, uh, the energy intensive sectors, uh, share of industrial energy use has increased, but in OECD countries, there's a uh, declining of um, energy intensive uh, sectors. And also, uh, is this uh, related to the carbon leakage uh, in the climate change negotiation? Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, interesting question. So if we um, if we look at the, the trend that we have observed over the over the last um, 10 or 15 years, um, oh, sorry, it was um, 25 years, it was related to 1990. Um, yeah, we see two different um, aspects play a role. I mean, the first is uh, what the demand for materials in different parts of the world, and they are clearly we uh, we could have uh, we have observed um, in the past a strong material demand in cement, for example, in in China also iron and steel. Um, as I mentioned, it tripled since 2005. The iron steel demand in China. So one part is um, where is the demand, and the second part is then also the question uh, where are the materials produced and to which extent they can be shipped. We talk about cement. There are the possibility to transport, transport cement are limited, so there is very close closely uh, located um, to the demand. If we talk about other um, other materials, there's possibility for, for trade, and it also relates to the question of leakage. And um, there is the question, what the, what the current cost structure in the industry, what's possible to move uh, production facilities um, to places where costs are lower, whether it's energy costs, whether it's labor costs. For example, if you look at aluminum, that's an industry which is very much uh, where the, the uh, production costs are very much influenced by the cost of electricity. So there we see trend uh, loca facilities located in places like Iceland, uh, where the production is uh, due to the electricity, hydroelectricity is cheap. So these factors are influencing um, the, the choices of production facilities and also the production, overall production that we observe in different parts of the world. Um, for the future, if we look in the scenarios, especially if we look at a two degree scenario, there's clearly the, the risk of leakage depending on how global climate targets are um, are, are implemented. Um, so there, for example, one can talk about discuss what approaches are to look at industry um, specific targets in one sub industry uh, industry uh, subsector. 
um, compared, let's say, to, to approaches where um, our complementing approaches like what we see, for example, in Europe with the ETS system where basically we've got a cap across different industry sectors. So clearly there's a leakage that needs to be addressed to avoid the situation that if there are very stringent um, reduction um, policies increasing the costs of energy in, uh, in some parts of the world compared to other parts which are not uh, subject to these, um, to these policies at the risk of leakage. But I mean, that's again in our scenarios, we're looking at just a quite optimistic scenario, what we are doing is basically looking where it's, um, where it's basically cost effective to, um, to, uh, to produce materials. Um, we don't, haven't looked so much into the aspect of leakage so far also, as I, as I said, there's really the risk of leakage if there is a kind of um, asymmetry between, between policies um, um, which are imposed on industry different parts of the world. Uh, thank you very much, because uh, we have received many questions, especially for China. So uh, the next question uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Keith. So how could the China launch a new carbon market in 2017 uh, that also influence innovation and investment moving forward? Uh, yes, Kevin. Uh, Thank you for that uh, question. Uh, so my <coughs> understanding of the question is uh, that um, uh, China announced uh, earlier, I think in its joint statement with um, the United States, that uh, it will be developing uh, a, an emissions trading scheme um, in, in the near future. So, uh, and, and, and this question uh, refers to that, uh, how might that uh, uh, promote further uh, innovation and investment? Uh, I think the, uh, the, 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 the short answer is that um, uh, if an emissions uh, trading scheme is brought in, then it will, uh, it, it will put constraints on, uh, further constraints on the uh, uh, emissions that can be produced and, 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 and uh, the, uh, the uh, power companies and industry uh, will need to uh, find uh, new and innovative, innovative uh, ways to, uh, to deal with these tighter constraints on their, uh, uh, in their sectors. Uh, what we have seen in the past and what experience has shown us, and, uh, and, and China has demonstrated this uh, very well over, uh, over many years, is that um, where, there, where there are constraints uh, uh, put on, uh, on emissions, then, then developments in technology uh, will follow to, uh, to meet those. And uh, uh, for example, for example uh, uh, China has some of the uh, strictest uh, constraints on uh, air pollutants from uh, from power generation in in the uh, in the world today. Uh, that that they uh, they they were brought in in 2012, 2013, and China uh, in in meeting these uh, constraints. China has uh, improved the efficiency of its uh, power generation fleet quite significantly, and simply improving the efficiency reduces the specific emissions of uh, of all its pollutants. So, not only that has it uh, impacted on reducing uh, uh, air pollutants, but also uh, or greenhouse gas CO2 emissions. So, I think that the uh, introduction of an emissions Trading scheme will clearly lead to uh, to uh, uh, further investment going into meeting those meeting the uh, uh, reductions required and uh, and the uh, innovations will follow. Uh, thank you very much, Keith, uh, for your answer. Uh, so before I move to the beginning of the questions we have received, I'd like to ask. Uh, uh, it's a bit difficult question. Uh, this question uh, is addressed to uh, our second speaker, Daniel, but also the other two speakers are welcome 
uh, to give their uh, answers to this one. According to the energy technology perspective, by 2015, nearly 75% of the annual reduction in energy-related carbon emissions in the two-degree scenario need to come from non-OECD countries. If we look at uh, uh, what will happen in COP21 uh, in Paris late this year, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, equity issues will be raised by emerging economies. So uh, if we uh, have a study that asks the emerging economy and non-OECD country to show the, uh, the majority of the greenhouse gas reduction uh, responsibility, then what mechanism might be designed uh, during the COP21 to address equity issues? I know this uh, one might be a little bit difficult to address, but somehow I think it's also a very important question. Uh, I'll, uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to premise that uh, the 75% uh, cited uh, what is uh, the uh, annual uh, carbon emission reduction uh, projected by our ETP 2DS by 2050. And this is uh, essentially um, the uh, result of uh, uh, cost optimization exercise and uh, uh, it's not based on uh, specific, I mean, subjective or expert judgment uh, in itself. And, and this indicates simply that uh, at, at some point, uh, mature OECD countries will uh, have reached their uh, cost-effective uh, carbon mitigation potential. And uh, given the uh, projected increases in the final energy demand from emerging economies, in 30 years uh, from now, the uh, actual uh, cost effectiveness of reaching an ambitious climate uh, change mitigation scenario might rely on uh, action uh, that is predomin predominantly undertaken or also undertaken in emerging economies. And with regard to the specific uh, mechanism, well, um, as you all know, there are uh, several um, uh, specific measures being discussed on the table and, and to what extent uh, the, a global mechanism is likely. Uh, possibly I, I wouldn't be able to assign a specific probability right now. But uh, uh, what I would like to emphasize is the um, value, which is the, this is in line with the topic of ETP 2015, the value of international technology collaboration to spur uh, technology innovation on low carbon uh, technology. We need uh, uh, countries to work together to accelerate technology innovation, and this eventually would make it uh, carbon emissions reduction more feasible, less costly, and um, an ambitious scenario like the 2DS would not uh, raise particular concerns in terms of economic impact or energy affordability and so forth. I don't know if my colleagues would like to add anything on that. Uh, yes, uh, just a, uh, this is Keith Bernard, and uh, just a uh, uh, a short um, uh, addition to uh, uh, Daniele's um, uh, answer there. I, 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 I believe that um, uh, countries are already uh, uh, making contributions to uh, uh, green funds to um, support uh, movements in this direction in uh, in developing uh, uh, and uh, emerging economies and uh, certainly the the, the uh, US has made uh, major uh, uh, funds available for or, or are making major fund 
that's available through that um, mechanism. And, and China has also uh, uh, stated that it's making uh, major funds uh, or similar uh, magnitude funds through through that uh, same mechanism. Oh, thank you very much uh, for your answers. Now I'd like to uh, go to the first question we received. Uh, this uh, is for the first speaker, Uber. Uh, so, interesting chart on industry and the part of process innovation needed to get to the two degree scenario. How big is that part in numbers? Is the industry the only sector where you singled out uh, innovation that needs so clearly as opposed to using the BAU scenario? Uh, to using uh, best available technology, uh, sorry for this. So the only other example I can think of is CCS. So uh, do you have any uh, insights on that question? Um, yeah, if you look in, in industry, I mean, CCS is really the crucial um, technology that's needed to, um, to uh, reduce uh, process emissions. Actually, that's I mean, we could think about um, other options. There are innovative technologies for industry. If we look at steel making, we can look at use of hydrogen in um, direct uh, reduction uh, technologies for, um, for iron, make, iron and steel making. Uh, we can also um, look at um, increased use of, um, of, of biofuels or uh, uh, renewables in general. So, uh, so biofuels also, they are biomass. There is also the issue of sustainability. Uh, we can look into use of um, solar thermal energy to support um, process heat needs in combination with uh, with other with um, other fuels or technologies. Um, so there are innovative or yeah, innovative technologies available, or could be technologies in the long term available to um, um, other than CCS to reduce um, CO2 in industry. If we look at um, other sectors, um, if you look, for example, at, um, at, at the power generation, there, um, in my view, it's um, it's maybe not so much the um, innovation that's needed on the um, technology generation side, because many of the technologies that we see in the long term in that scenario, for example, um, solar PV or wind, they are already available. Today, the other challenge is more um, to reduce costs, um, to bridge, if we talk about CCS and power generation, to bridge the uh, so-called uh, value of death to deploy or demonstrate technologies um, on a commercial scale. And um, on the other hand, as I briefly mentioned in my presentation, also on the challenge um, to how to operate the overall electricity system. Um, so it means that we have to look if we have regions where we, for example, in uh, some parts in our 2D as we see that the share of very renewables increases up to 40% in the electricity system. So that's clearly challenges how to have more flexibility in the system, how to operate. I, I would say that part is more um, the um, kind of innovation that's, uh, that's needed in uh, operating electricity system. And there are different measures that are available. We can talk about more traditional ones to increase flexibility, to have more flexible um, generation plans like gas-fired power generation. Uh, we can uh, talk about um, large-scale electricity um, uh, storage, um, for example, pump storage, but also batteries. We can talk about, if we talk about decentralized electricity generation, we can also talk about um, um, decentralized um, battery storage within distribution grids. Uh, we can talk about um, larger or stronger um, transmission grids, meaning that way reducing the or balancing of the variability between different parts in a large electricity system, and uh, we also have to think about uh, to look beyond the electricity system or generation side. Also, to look at the at the end use sectors to look at options for uh, demand response in electricity demand. For example, we see the opportunity to use um, electric vehicles through smart charging to um, to uh, absorb part of the surplus uh, variability uh, next generation variable sources. Um, and um, in the long term, we can also uh, there are also options discussed like um, power to gas or power to heat. Actually, power to heat is also happening in, in some countries like Denmark, where um, 
electric boilers or electric heat pumps are used to convert the surplus electricity from wind um, for district heating. So I guess there are different um, innovations that are possible in the system. So we, I mean, in my presentation, I briefly talked just about the uh, highlighted in the industry sector, but clearly innovation also has to uh, happen in, in all energy sectors. It's not limited to the, to the industry one. Uh, so the next question uh, is addressed to our third speaker, Keith Bernard. Uh, so do you see uh, there's uh, any possibility for China to take uh, a legally binding obligating uh, climate target uh, before 2030? Uh, this is an interesting question. I think it's beyond my uh, remit to uh, uh, to answer this question. Uh, uh, clearly, we have some uh, important uh, meetings and negotiations coming up uh, in here in Paris in December, and uh, the outcome the outcome of uh, uh, the outcome of those negotiations will give us a more clear ind indication of um, uh, who is willing to sign up to what uh, particular uh, 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 future ambitions uh, in this area. But uh, I, I, I'm afraid I'm unable to uh, provide a more specific uh, uh, answer to that. I don't know if... Um, uh, Kevin, you yourself have any uh, uh, response on that, or whether you feel that it's um, beyond the IEA's remit to uh, to uh, discuss these items? Uh, personally, I am pretty confident uh, the Chinese government will act more in terms of uh, um, domestic uh, climate actions, and also China has. Uh, already jointly announced with the United States uh, to pick its uh, national uh, uh, carbon emissions around 2030. Uh, however, ju just as what Keith uh, has just mentioned, uh, COP uh, is uh, quite a political process. Uh, currently, it's uh, relatively uh, difficult for uh, we at the IEA, as an international organization, to predict uh, what uh, the Chinese government eventually may commit uh, by 2030. So now I'd like to uh, move to uh, the next question. This one is quite an interesting one, and also uh, it's a, a quite a difficult question to answer. Uh, we have received a question uh, about whether it's possible uh, to have a uh, uh, energy future without uh, nuclear energy. So uh, this question can be answered by anyone. Do you have any opinion about this? Um, yeah, this Uwe. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, if you talk about nuclear, clearly it's um, it's a controversial um, technology and. Um, it's not only the choice to use nuclear, it's not only um, choice influenced by pure techno-economic consideration, but also issues like public acceptance, public support are needed, as we see in different countries regarding their role of nuclear. And um, if you look at the electricity sector, um, in our scenarios, um, as I've shown, nuclear can still play an important role in countries where nuclear is still on the... Um, uh, a possible option in relation to specifically we talk about uh, China, their nuclear can play an important role. I mean, it's still in terms of global deployment. I mean, it's still other generation technologies, um, low-carbon generation technologies are, are needed. Um, and in the electricity sector, the other options are then to, to increase renewables. Um, as I said, the other challenge is to address the variability if we want to have a large scale generation from, from solar PV and, and wind, um, there is the, the option to use um, CCS. I mean, that's an interesting option specifically if you look at coal, which is um, 
much more widely wider distributed than, for example, uh, gas and oil. So there's also some energy security um, issues related to that choice. Um, so in, uh, in general, on the electricity side, I would say that it's possible in some countries to um, to replace nuclear. As we've shown in our scenarios, we still think that nuclear can be a cost-effective option in some parts of the world. Um, thank you very much uh, for your um, answers. Uh, I would also like to share some of my own uh, observation about uh, nuclear development in different parts of the world. If we look at uh, what happened uh, um, after Fukushima, uh, at a global scale, certainly nuclear development has slowed down. If we take China as an example, before uh, Fukushima Daiichi, uh, China's uh, uh, nuclear plan in 2020 uh, is much more ambitious than uh, what, what is now. Uh, in the past, uh, when we talk about uh, the operational nuclear capacity in China in 2020, uh, the target uh, could be any number uh, around 80 gigawatt or even more than 100 gigawatt. But uh, after Fukushima Daiichi, uh, because of the concern of the safety and uh, the change of public opinion, uh, China has become more cautious in terms of uh, the technological uh, route selection in terms of the siting of nuclear power plants and in terms of uh, whether the country should kick off its inland nuclear development now. Uh, the operational nuclear capacity in China in 2020 is most likely uh, around 50 gigawatts. Uh, that's uh, uh, much lower than the number uh, we discussed in the past. However, um, the question we received uh, is a hypothetical question because uh, although some countries have already given nuclear development up, but uh, if we look at uh, um, key emerging economies such as China and India, uh, the interest on nuclear development is still reasonably strong. So actually, there will no such a scenario in the future. So this is something I would like to uh, bring to everyone's attention. Now I'd like to move to another question uh, that is also addressed to the first speaker. Uh, Uwe, what do you think is the role of community engagement in wide technology diffusion of renewable and energy efficiency technology globally. Do you think renewable industry, governments, and NGOs should make concerted efforts to globally enhance community engagement with emissions reduction efforts? Um, I guess it's a very interesting, uh, interesting question because it touches on different, also on the question. Um, how we think the uh, future electricity system will be designed. If you look at the traditional system, it's very much a centralized system where the, the scope for um, community engagement or support is, um, I would say, on the direction side at least, very much limited. What we see happening now is that um, more and more deployment of um, decentralized generation, if you talk about basically the, um, the uptake of solar PV, um, in different parts of the world due to reduced costs. Um, so that means the energy system that the electricity system that we see in the future will be much more um, decentralized compared to today. It doesn't mean that we uh, won't have the need for or the opportunity for centralized generation options. I guess the challenge is how to, how to um, integrate more decentralized or distributed generation into, um, okay. into the electricity system so that's more from the technology side, if we talk about the community engagement, I guess that's very, uh, very important to, to, um, to uh, especially to change the attitude to some projects. If we talk about the need to build um, transmission lines, um, that's, our, I'd say, okay, that's more a, 
um, a centralized option. But I guess that's also the the kind of common um, common agreement needed in a country or society which way to pursue in that level. And coming back to community engaged or uh, community support and engagement, I guess that's something that's already happening on the ground. If you look at different countries, there are initiatives that cities are deploying their own, um, for example, wind turbines, building their own um, decentralized resources. So I guess that's a step in the direction to a more decentralized system, but also um, ensure support from the community. It doesn't necessarily have to be the most, let's say, cost-effective way from a pure technocomic basis, but I guess the important aspect is really that it um, uh, ignites um, the engagement uh, from public. So in that sense, I guess it's something still valuable also in scale. It might be sometimes to cover the overall electricity needs, the contribution might be very small, but I guess very important in terms of um, generating public support for these energy transition. Um, now uh, I have uh, one question for our third uh, speaker, Keith. Um, because uh, uh, the Chinese government uh, uh, this year has uh, uh, revised uh, its uh, historical energy consumption data, um, uh, especially in terms of uh, coal consumption. Uh, the number uh, has been adjusted upward significantly. So in the future, how this uh, new adjustment uh, could be reflected in uh, ETP's uh, 2016 analysis? Uh, could you share with us some insight about this uh, question? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, an important, uh, an interesting question and an, and an important uh, issue for us. In fact, we have um, fairly recently been uh, been uh, uh, made. Well, we, we've been aware of that a change of in the uh, um, data has been coming for some time, but we. Uh, we have just uh, uh, recently be, uh, had access to uh, some of the uh, some of the numbers, and our um, uh, our uh, modelers are uh, looking into this now to see what um, uh, how they can be uh, included in our uh, future analysis. Uh, the uh, uh, in the the short term, we, we have um, we will be releasing uh, 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 a major publication uh, th th this year, our uh, World Energy Outlook later, and um, uh, ET ETP analysis for 2016 is uh, well underway and will need to be completed uh, before the end of the year. So there will not be. Uh, an opportunity to um, uh, to uh, update our analysis uh, in the short term with, uh, with with a full set of the uh, uh, new information that's coming through. But what we are will be doing uh, is looking at um, is looking closely at it to see uh, certainly qualitatively what uh, what impact we'll have, and maybe look at some uh, uh, case studies to uh, look. Quantitatively, in uh, in some circumstances, to uh, to, to um, uh, fully appreciate the uh, impact of, of this, but as yet we uh, we have not started to uh, include the new information in our uh, in our data. I don't know if anyone else around the table would like to comment any further on this. Is there anything? Uh, as the China program manager at the IEA, I would like to give a quick comment about uh, the NBS, the National Bureau of Statistics, recent revision of China's uh, national energy balance table. Uh, because uh, um, different parts of the world uh, to uh, reach a 
sensible agreement during uh, COP21. So uh, National Bureau of Statistics uh, recent revision of China's uh, uh, coal data and uh, some additional data actually should be in welcomed by the international community. Uh, otherwise, if uh, this revision uh, are released after COP21, this will uh, create a trouble uh, for the outcome of COP21. Um, luckily, uh, NBS uh, was able to release the data uh, before uh, COP starts. Uh, this can still leave uh, relatively sufficient time for uh, many modeling teams around the world to assess uh, the potential impacts of global carbon emissions trajectories in the years to come. So this is how I uh, look at this issue uh, for my COP21 negotiation perspective. Now I'd, li I'd like to move to uh, the next question. Uh, it's for uh, Uber. Do we have enough data about CCS demonstration projects in order to support this technology as an environmentally friendly solution? Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the at CCS, I mean, in terms of um, the, the contribution it can make to CO2 reductions, I mean, I guess our analysis is quite clear that it um, uh, can be important. Um, in the overall technology mix to achieve a two degree um, pathway. And um, the challenge currently is, um, is, not our, is not so much on the technology side itself because the different components have been basically demonstrated already on the capture side, transport, and, and, and also storage of CO2. Um, what's needed now is more the uh, demonstration on a larger scale to uh, to um, demonstrate and verify the the interplay of these different components to ensure that the entire chain of CCS um, is working and also um, funding is needed to support the deployment of larger demonstration scale um, um, projects and um, in that sense we think CCS can be environmental friendly um, technology clearly there are also issues related like with coal generation without CCS. For example, uh, at water use, so there are also additional impacts of CCS, like with traditional coal technologies. I don't know whether Keith wants to add something uh, to that because it's also more uh, about coal technologies. <coughs> yes, thank, thank you, uh, Uwe. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, CCS demonstration uh, pro projects, we um, we, we, we noted from uh, what Uwe was saying earlier that uh, CCS is uh, needed in power and also in industry. Well, in industry, for, uh, for uh, we, we have had CCS demonstrations now, and the, uh, the earliest one, uh, uh, Sleipner, Norway's Sleipner project, where uh, um, it separates uh, CO2 from... Um, from natural gas and then uh, stores it in an, say, in a saline aquifer under the, the uh, in the North Sea. That project has been uh, storing about one million tons of CO2 a year, and I think coming up now is its uh, 20th anniversary. So there and. So that, that, that one has uh, uh, clearly been a long-standing demonstration project. There are others in the world in the uh, interim, uh, mainly on ga gas processing, uh, removal of carbon dioxide from natural gas, because it gives, um, uh, it gives uh, 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 it's relatively uh, simple to separate and uh, uh, separate the carbon dioxide, and it also um, uh, uh, provides a high, high, high concentration uh, CO2 stream, and so it's ideal for uh, uh, for uh, taking away, uh, for transporting, for storage. Um, 
there have been, as I say, several uh, industrial uh, uh, CCS projects over the years. Uh, you, uh, but last year, towards the end of the last year, there was a, a major breakthrough in um, uh, CCS demonstration when the Boundary Dam project in Canada was launched uh, CCS on a uh, coal-fired power station, the first one in the uh, the first one in the world, and that one has been operating uh, uh, very effectively since it was, uh, as I say, it was commissioned uh, late uh, in 2014. In fact, in the uh, during the uh, 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 um, construction stage. Uh, or, or following experience, I should say, gained in the construction, construction and commissioning stage, the uh, the owners of that plant now feel that they could uh, that they could build a uh, CCS demonstration uh, for about 20 to 30 percent less than the than, than the uh, cost. Uh, for, for the first of first of a kind there on a uh, coal-fired power station so there is uh, so it's a major uh, project in from one point of view uh, that um, that it's the first one on coal-fired power generation but also it shows the uh, benefit of these large-scale demonstrations in demonstrating that we can uh, that we can reduce cost in the future in the next couple of years, uh, there will be further uh, CCS projects, uh, demonstration projects at uh, commercial scale in the United States. Uh, I think there are maybe four or five coming in uh, online in the next uh, in the next couple of years. So. China has uh, also been uh, uh, building up, uh, building its capacity on uh, CCS. With, uh, with, 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 with initially around uh, uh, 2008, with its first um, uh, uh, pilot project on a uh, coal-fired power station, and scaling that up. And uh, now it also uh, is planning to have or has uh, commercial site, uh, uh, commercial. Uh, um, uh, commercial size uh, CO2 removal from um, coal-fired power, power stations. I should also say that um, China, with its um, with its uh, re recent activity or, 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 or activity now over several years in using uh, coal as a, uh, a, a as a feedstock to produce um, uh, uh, liquid liquid fuels, that that there has also been demonstrations of uh, CCS on um, on coal to liquid plants in in, in China. So another uh, another de uh, uh, industrial scale uh, demonstration on that. So I think we're now getting to the stage where we have a lot of confidence in the technology. It's the business case that needs to be uh, made for the uh, further implementation, de broader deployment of carbon capture and storage. Now uh, it's uh, 11.45. Um, before I summarize the event, I, as a moderate, am very interested in uh, the ETP 2016. So I'd like to ask our second speaker, Danini, uh, to give us a brief introduction about uh, uh, ETP 2016. Thank you, Kevin. So our next ETP report uh, will be focused on cities and uh, the role of urban energy systems in uh, supporting both global and national energy transitions. As uh, everybody knows, the uh, demographic growth in uh, urban cities uh, expected in the next 30 to 40 years will also drive energy consumption significantly. And uh, with this uh, will, will also come, with this trend will also come 
uh, important challenges to local energy policy makers to foster uh, sustainable energy transitions and at the local level. And what one of the questions that uh, we aim to uh, address with the next, uh, with this forthcoming report is how national policymakers can support, can enable uh, local energy transition so that in turn cities can uh, realize their potential to contribute to eventually making the 2D grid scenario possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, summarize today's events uh, with uh, some bonus for each of the presentation. For our um, first presentation on the global energy outlook, the key message I got is that if we compare the difference between the two degree and the six degree um, scenario, we can certainly see the important role energy technology innovation should play in mobilizing climate actions to accelerate the transition towards a more sustainable global energy system. Uh, for the second uh, presentation that focuses on emerging economies, the key message I got uh, is that uh, emerging economies are tremendously important to reach the two-degree scenario. By 2050, more than two-thirds of annual reduction in energy-related carbon emissions in the two-degree scenario need to come from non-OECD countries. The need to expand infrastructure gives emerging economies a distinct opportunity to reduce or eliminate carbon dioxide emissions. Growing demand linked to population growth, economic development, and the goals to achieve universal access is a major drive for energy system expansion. During the build-out process, these countries can use a systematic approach to deploy innovative low-carbon technologies and to leap forward to more sustainable energy systems without going through the same carbon lock in process of many OECD countries. For the third um, presentation that focuses on China, the take-home message I got is that China is poised to become a global leader in R&D spending. This momentum could provide a huge opportunity for the low carbon transition at a global scale if more innovative energy technologies can be developed in China and deployed globally. China's low carbon innovation policies will be a key driver to making the 2D, uh, two degree scenario possible. The ability of China to develop and deploy innovative low-carbon technology uh, domestically, but also at the global scale, uh, is very important for the two-degree scenario. And uh, this can be done through the significant export capacity of Chinese companies. Uh, thank you uh, very much for attending uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, I'm very glad to announce today there are around 400 uh, participants from different parts of the world to attend this seminar. After the seminar, we at IEA will send out uh, the PDF version of today's three presentations to your email account. Please also uh, uh, note that uh, the audio recording of the um, webinar will be made online. Uh, after uh, uh, our uh, webinar is finished. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, uh, depending on which part of the world you are from. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.